case study of freshwater community ecology and shoreline organic matter. Um, just a little bit of background on this case study. It's occurring right at Paulson Mills College, Lower St. Regis Lake, and the reference site to Black Pond. And uh, it's a little bit of a background here is that in 2014 or 15, the college started an ecological restoration program. We thought this would be a good opportunity to do something right on site. And so we have this break wall on campus that's starting to fall apart, but it's also a place where uh, we have about two or three dozen geese that like to show up and just with one beat of their wings are up on the shore and next thing you know you have this big mess. So there's a lot of reasons for, for looking at this, but um, uh, I decided to turn into a, a more comprehensive ecological study working with students over time. So there's three basic questions that we wanted to answer. How to gauge levels of shoreline impairment? How useful are the invertebrates and fishes as metrics for assessing and monitoring shoreline restoration? And are there other community or ecosystem attributes that might be useful for assessing shoreline conditions? And so these, this is basically a summary of some initial observations and of patterns and processes uh, from a, a lot of smaller three, four credit projects for yeah, pro, uh, projects or courses. And it, I think it does a really fine job of telling the story here. But uh, we're to begin with the story, first looking at the patterns and process and setting up the environment here before looking at the fishes and the birds. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is how do, act, just how do we define levels of impacts? We did that, preliminary uh, uh, definition of impact levels. Uh, we wanted to get a handle on organic matter sources and retention and understand a little bit the effects of wind on shoreline organic matter. And so, uh, we took a look at our worst case, we called that our impact at sites, is the absence of natural ground vegetation and trees. Large woody structure is rare or absent, and the source of woody structure inputs from adjacent riparian areas or lakeshore areas is absent or minimal. Compared to the far right here, the reference conditions, uh, oops, I'm sorry, let me back up. Um, th these are sites that have natural vegetation, fairly well, um, uh, the vegetation is, is well established, it's, it's not impacted at all, very little. So there's natural vegeta vegetation and tree composition, there's large woody structure naturally abundant along the shoreline, and a high uh, natural potential of large woody structure sources for the lake, either by windfall or, or, or beavers coming in and cutting the trees down, and in some cases a little bit of shoreline erosion might break, bring in the woody debris. And then we have the minimally impacted sites that were in between these two. Now the impacted sites, the minimally impacted sites, um, were on Lower St. Regis, and you can see, which you can show it. so there's, there's a college campus right here, and the greatest shoreline is along this part of the lake, and so we, all, we selected minimally impacted sites, we selected them on this side of the lake because they wanted to be on the, on the uh, downwind side, so we know the things that wind can have a big influence. And then our reference sites were located on Black Pond. And we realized this wasn't perfect, but it was a start and we may expand this to some other sites in the future. So organic matter sources. So we, we designed this project in a way where uh, the, the sampling would be standardized among the different impact levels. And that would be, all the sampling would be integrated. For example, the shoreline vegetation, trees, understory, and ground cover were sampled along 60 meter sections. And within these same sections, um, students looked at the large woody structure in the lake with a, uh, following a host of measurements, standardized measurements. We had one student look at leaf fall, looking at how much leaves in fall were falling on the shoreline and how much was actually available on the lake to see if there was a difference um, uh, between the two. And we had another student then also take core samples in the same areas uh, to look at coarse and fine particulate organic matter. But just to get a handle on the organic matter, the large stuff and the very fine stuff. Now, uh, this is a summary of that information. There's a lot more, <coughs> excuse me. But we can see that the reference reference site, sorry, um, and, and a, a minimally impacted sites can't be covered was much higher than at the impact sites. This is, this is, uh, no mystery here, but at least we have some measurements. And along with that, in the reference sites, 
Uh, the volume of woody debris, I should say woody structure, woody sounds like junk, we know it's not junk. Um, woody structure uh, was much higher at the reference sites and the impacted site, but it was also high at the minimally impacted site. And we found a lot of variation out there. We only had three sites. We know that uh, for as variable as some of these environments are, there's just simply not enough. Uh, the minimally impacted site was one location that actually had a lot of uh, human cut logs, uh, so it did bias that a little bit. Um, in terms of, of uh, ground cover, the obligate wetland species at the reference sites and also at the, I'm sorry, I'm thinking my thumbs are too big for this, but uh, uh, the, the reference sites, yep. I'll just let you look in that and I'll point it out. <laughs> so uh, the reference sites, the uh, obligate wetland species, are species that occur in wetlands uh, greater than 99% of the time, and the facultative wetland species are those that occur in wetlands only 1 to 33% of the time. And we can see that the, the obligate wetland species were uh, more prevalent is where we have species, in terms of species richness at the reference sites and the minimally impacted sites. In contrast, the um, reference sites, make sure I'm reading that correctly, the reference sites had um, less uh, facultative upland species compared to the impacted sites, uh, which would indicate a little bit about the hydrology and maybe the physical complexity of the shoreline. Um, looking at the autumn leaf litter, this is what we uh, first expected. We went into it without trying not to have too many expectations, but we can see that uh, the aquatic leaf litter, and I think this is in dry weight grams per, per square meter, the aquatic leaf litter uh, was much lower at the impacted sites than at the, or let me, let me shift my mind here a little bit, at the impacted sites, the aquatic leaf litter was much lower than that found in the terrestrial environment adjacent to the shoreline. So if I could just read this here, could a comparison of leaf litter in terrestrial zones to that in the adjacent aquatic zones suggest the importance of woody structure and leaf retention? So the impacted sites, very little woody debris, minimally impacted sites more, a lot of woody structure, excuse me, uh, in the reference sites, and we, uh, there is a relationship, there appears to be a relationship. It certainly seems that where you have a lot of wood structure, um, it can break the wave action and such and allow for that fine and first particular organic matter to also um, accumulate. As, I, as I'm showing here, at the impacted sites, of course, and fine particular organic matter was not measurable. It doesn't mean it wasn't present, it just wasn't measurable. It didn't pick up with the plastic tube that the, one of the students was pushing into the substrate. Um, at the minimally impacted site, it was still pretty low. But what's interesting, at the reference sites, the coarse and fine particulate organic matter was much higher than the other sites. Um, but I thought what was interesting is that the reference sites, the fine particulate organic matter was almost three times that coarse particulate organic matter, which may suggest even longer retention periods. Uh, fine particulate organic matter is typically coarse particulate organic matter. Uh, prior, so a, a breakdown period uh, would occur, which, which means that this might be an indicator of, a, of a, could be a useful indicator of how long a site has been unimpacted or on the processing capacity of the site uh, for organic matter or unorganic matter. I wanted to bring this slide in. We had a, some students look at uh, wind velocity. And I think what's interesting here, I, I tried to put demonstrate here, put a, a, a slide in, or a picture in here, a diagram, to show what might be happening. Um, right at the shoreline, these bottom three lines are at the minimally impacted sites. And right at the shoreline, where you have no trees, the wind velocity did not slow down. But where there were trees, the wind velocity right at the shoreline, not out in the lake or a meter, five meters back, the, wa the water bump or the wind velocity was also lower. And it's probably because of this buffering capacity of, of this of a natural barrier along the shoreline. Um, so that wind action um, was reduced not only because of the large woody structure in the lake, but perhaps just because of the trees present on the shoreline. So in a nutshell, to summarize the level of impact, 
uh, the, where there was a lack of natural shoreline vegetation, there was very little woody structure, low amounts of forest and plant particulate organic matter, and no wind protection or buffer. Compared to natural shoreline vegetation, there are high amounts of woody structure, high amounts of forest and plant particulate organic matter, and there was wind protection and buffer. So how do the invertebrates and, and fish community then conform to the presence, this presence of organic matter? So um, right here I'll just present four ways, macroinvertebrates and woody structure, macroinvertebrates and substrate, fish density, the level of impact, and fish diet, and near shore woody structure. So uh, the macroinvertebrates and uh, woody structure, uh, students sampled this with a sweep net, it was, it was kind of difficult, it's not perhaps the, the best approach to getting invertebrates off of woody debris, but they had a sweep net, they would push it down the length of the log, measure that length and, and look at the number of invertebrates sampled per meter to standardize that. And this is what they found. Let's see, the mean density of, of macroinvertebrates on logs was higher at reference sites than it was at impacted sites. Uh, minimally impacted sites were somewhere in between. Um, the fish density, however, I'm sorry, family richness, um, getting ahead of myself, family richness was higher at the minimally impacted sites. So remember the impacted sites and min impact and minimally impacted sites were on lower St. Regis Lake, while the reference sites were on Black Pond. So although the densities were higher on the structure at the reference sites in Black Pond, the family richness was much higher at minimally impacted sites in lower St. Regis. So we don't know if this was maybe associated with uh, slight differences in trophic state or maybe sampling design. Same technique, but maybe it wasn't the best. Um, we had one student look at the invertebrates and the substrate in the same exact areas in an Ekman dredge, nine sites uh, per, uh, nine plots per, per site, subplots. And um, basically, uh, the overall invertebrate richness was higher at the benchmark to the same as the reference sites uh, compared to the impacted and minimally impacted sites. That was broken down a little bit as well. I'm going to move forward. Um, it wasn't the same for all species. The odonates, the density of odonates was much higher to benchmark and minimally impacted sites and were essentially non existent or um, at low numbers, low enough numbers not to sample at the impacted sites. In contrast, the gamerids had a greater density in the minimally, minimally impacted sites compared to the benchmark and the impacted sites. <coughs> Some other species uh, show the same relationship. And then we thought, well, regardless of uh, impact level, let's just look at substrate. And so uh, there's a comparison here of inorganic substrates, sand and gravel, with organic substrates, and also uh, substrates that were mixed. And uh, this, you can see this is good, rich stuff in those areas uh, where this uh, matter is retained. We had no idea what we were going to find. Some said, some said you're not going to find that much. Uh, we, we found otherwise. Um, so, oh, okay, I skipped over this, sorry. So the family richness was uh, much higher in the organic substrates than in the mixed or inorganic substrates. And one thing I want to say, the organic substrates, um, the ornate um, densities were higher, than, as I said in the previous slide. I think it was, uh, Four, four different families of old dates were, were located uh, where there was organic substrates. Anyways, the fish densities and level of impact, we've done this three times now, at least two times, I think three times, looking at uh, the minimally impacted sites and impact is just on Lower St. Regis Lake, not the reference sites because of the different fish community, but the mean number of small fishes for 100 meter shoreline um, was much higher than the impacted sites, the, the lowest uh, catch that we had at any of the impacted sites was much higher than the highest catch of the impacted sites. Um, the standardized sampling that we use in this woody structure may not have been the best, but it seems to be indicating to us that the standardized sampling with backpack electric fishing unit in these shoreline areas is useful. Um, fish diet, near shore woody structure, a uh, pair of students looked at use versus availability, and um, what was found on the course of woody debris uh, was not significantly different than what was found in the stomach, so it appeared that uh, um, the fishes were not selecting toward one taxonomic group, at least at the level that we identified that. Uh, what was 
also interesting is that in the near shore areas compared to offshore areas, fishes in these areas, the near shore areas, had a higher percentage of mackerel invertebrates, while in the offshore areas, we're talking just offshore, not, not way out in the middle of the lake, five meters away from the shoreline, had higher uh, percentages of zooplankton. Again, it's just frequency of occurrence. It doesn't say anything about food value or anything like that. And we just a quarter in fact saying that the sample fishes in the offshore areas. Um, so in summary, I can say, we can say the level of impairment, of impairment can be quantified. Uh, the vertebrates and fish communities can be linked to levels of impairment. So there's some useful metrics to be gotten. Um, and there are other community ecosystem attributes that can be used to assess impairment and to monitor succession during uh, restoration efforts. So it's not just fish, it's an, an entire ecosystem or aquatic terrestrial transition zone. Um, finally, I just want to acknowledge all the students, and there's, uh, this list is much longer than what's, uh, what I'm showing right now, that have contributed to um, the accumulation of I hope is reliable knowledge over time. It certainly seems that way. That's all I have.